Good morning and welcome to online worship at Lemoore Presbyterian Church on this fourth Sunday of Advent. Wherever you are today, may the Lord bless you and may you feel like part of our church family. If you are a first time visitor with us this morning, we invite you to explore our website, lemoorepress.com, to get to know us and our mission better. You'll also find a link there for making online donations to support the mission of the church. Our call to worship this morning begins with the lighting of the fourth Advent candle, which represents love. We light this candle as a sign of God's love. As the prophet Isaiah says, therefore the Lord himself will give all of you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God of the future, you are coming in power to bring all nations under your rule. We confess that we have not expected your kingdom, for we live casual lives, ignoring your promised judgment. We accept lies as truth, exploit neighbors, abuse the earth, and refuse your justice and peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Grant us wisdom to welcome your way and to seek the things that will endure when Christ comes to judge the world. Amen. Hear the good news. While we were still sinners, Christ died and rose for us. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This year during Advent, we have been listening to the prophet Isaiah, who keeps us from rushing ahead into Christmas, and instead reminds us how to wait for God's arrival. We're not very good at waiting, not least because waiting forces us to confront both our greatest hopes and our greatest fears, both of which are met in Jesus. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would take your word to us this morning and plant it deeply within our hearts so that it would grow and bear good fruit for the sake of your kingdom. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture is from Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some Christmas carols contain truly beautiful theology. For example, one of my favorites is from O Little Town of Bethlehem, where it says, The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. That's a bold claim made not only by this beloved Christmas carol, but also by Scripture itself, the claim that in the small and otherwise insignificant country town of Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of the entire human race down through the ages were met in a single event, a single person, a helpless infant. You'd think that such a person would arrive with a little more dignity and fanfare but then again, you'd be thinking the way the world thinks and not the way God thinks. The birth of Jesus was remarkably unremarkable for someone who would bear the hopes and fears of the whole world on his shoulders. And yet that is exactly what the gospel claims. The gospel claims that Jesus is the beginning and the end of all things that he is the culmination and the purpose of all human history, all creation history, all salvation history. John 1 says, All things were made through him, and nothing was made without him. In Romans, Paul says, He is the source 
guide and goal of all that is. And in Ephesians, Paul says, Christ existed before all things and all things are held together in him. If you're a fan of Douglas Adams' novel, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll remember that his famous answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is the number 42. And it's funny because it's ridiculous that such a big question could have such a simple and singular answer. And yet that is basically what the gospel claims, that the answer to every ultimate question is a singular person, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in him. Now, this claim would not have seemed ridiculous to Isaiah, who said as much in this famous passage about God's servant. It begins with our hopes, specifically the high hopes that God's servant, the, the one the ancient Israelites had been waiting for, would be exalted. Israel hoped that God would send them a king who would overthrow their enemies and be exalted as a great king of kings. They hoped that God would save them and give them a better life. Our hopes are not so different today. I mean, we may not hope for a king per se, but we hope that God will send us the help we need. We hope that God will save us from our enemies, from grief and pain and death, from loneliness and anxiety, from failure and financial ruin. We hope that God will give us a better life for ourselves, for our children, for our country, and for the world. All our hopes point in the direction of a better world, one without sin, without violence, without racism, without disease. They point in the direction of a world where God is king and everyone and everything obeys him. Our hopes today are the same as they were for Israel so many years ago. And all of these hopes are met in Jesus. Jesus is the king and the savior of the world who is leading all of creation to its final goal in the kingdom of God. All our hopes are met in Jesus. But so are our fears. Our fears are also met in Jesus. When I first thought about this, I sort of imagined Jesus meeting our fears head on in order to face them down and overcome them. But after a while, I began to imagine how our fears are not just overcome by Jesus, but are actually confirmed by Jesus. Here's what I mean. Our fear is that we are not good enough for God. We are afraid that our sin, our selfishness, our inadequacy, our embarrassing thoughts and mistakes will be exposed. We are afraid that we are as lost as we sometimes know ourselves to be. And Jesus confirms those fears. Jesus confirms that we are lost sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus was brutally honest about our sin. He didn't just sweep our sin under the rug. He confronted it. This is why people who were aware of their sin had a much easier time meeting Jesus than the people who were very religious. The religious people wanted to go on believing that they were basically good. But Jesus wouldn't let them. In the light of Jesus' presence, our sin is exposed. He sees all of it, even if the rest of the world doesn't even if we don't see all of it ourselves. Jesus confirms that we are as lost as we feared. After all, he wouldn't have come if we weren't. But just when our fears and sins threaten to overwhelm us, something truly unexpected and marvelous happens. Isaiah foretold that God's appointed servant would suffer on our behalf. He says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. In other words, this servant, Jesus, 
has experienced human suffering, but at the time, we assumed it was because God was angry with him, that God was punishing him. Well, we were wrong. It turns out it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Jesus meets our fears by confirming how sinful we are, but then he meets our hopes by taking our sin upon himself in order to heal us and bring us peace. The word for this, by the way, is atonement. Jesus atones for our sins by taking their consequences away from us and upon himself. Martin Luther called this the glorious exchange. Christ became what he was not, sin, in order that we might become what we were not, the righteousness of God. Jesus is the suffering servant whose sacrificial death and subsequent resurrection make us one with God. Atonement is at one mint. Jesus restores our relationship with God. Now, some people might be wondering what Jesus' death and resurrection have to do with Christmas. In fact, I read just this last week about a homeowners association that asked one of its residents to remove a cross from their outdoor holiday decorations and even ask them to prove with scripture that the cross is a part of Christmas. Well, it, it's right here in Isaiah. The baby in the manger was born to be the suffering servant who alone would atone for our sins. And when the angel told Joseph to name his son Jesus, the angel said, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, of course, Joseph didn't know at the time exactly how that would happen, but we do. The death of Jesus is built into the prophecies and birth narratives of Scripture. The atonement is part of Advent, and the cross is part of Christmas. Which is why you can sing, O little town of Bethlehem. In the atonement, Jesus meets all of your hopes and fears. Both of them are fair game at Christmas. Sometimes during the holidays, you might feel pressure to ignore your suffering so that you can pretend that your life is like a Hallmark movie. Or other times you might feel pressure to do just the opposite and focus so much on your suffering that you fail to share in the joy of others around you. But Advent is a season that is honest enough to help you bring both your hopes and your fears to Jesus and see how he meets all of them. No wonder we light the love candle this week, for there can be no greater love than that of our Savior who laid down his life for ours. May his love carry you through the hopes and fears of all the years that lie ahead. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Did you know that your baby boy 
If you have a prayer request to share with us, we would love to pray for you. You can share requests by calling the church office or by contacting us online through our website or through our Facebook page and group. Keeping in mind that posts to the Facebook page are public, while posts to the group will remain private. Let us pray. God of all kindness, you gave your only Son because you love the world so much. We pray for the peace of the world. Move among us by your Spirit. Break down barriers of fear, suspicion, and hatred. Heal the human family of its divisions and unite it in the bonds of justice and peace. We pray for our country enrich our common life, strengthen the forces of truth and goodness, teach us to share prosperity that those whose lives are impoverished may pass from need and despair to dignity and joy. We pray for those who suffer. Surround them with your love, support them with your strength, console them with your comfort, and give them hope and courage beyond themselves. We pray for our families, for those whom we love. Protect them at home. Support them in times of difficulty and anxiety, that they may grow together in mutual love and understanding and rest content in one another. We pray for the church. Keep us true to the gospel and responsive to the gifts and needs of all. Make known your saving power in Jesus Christ, for whose kingdom we now pray as he himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to take a moment to thank all of you, our members, and some visitors as well for your ongoing financial support of this church throughout the last year. Your generosity has made the mission and ministry of this church possible during these difficult times and beyond. We truly appreciate all that you have done to support the work that God is doing among us and beyond us. We also want to invite you, if you are in a financial position to do so, that this week would be a good time to make a year-end donation to the church. Once again, we thank you for your support, and may the Lord bless your giving, for it is truly better to give than it is to receive. Thank you.
And now, friends, whatever hopes and fears you are carrying with you through this holiday season, may you discover how all of them are met in Jesus Christ, who is with you on your right and on your left, Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ above you, Christ beneath you, and Christ within you, the hope of glory. Abide in his name. Amen.